Today, one of the major issues surrounding the teaching of grammar is whether the focus of a grammar class should be on form or function. Teachers and material designers who believe in primarily focusing on form maintain that grammar classes and texts should be organized on the basis of grammatical forms, such as the verb tense. There are several advantages to organizing the lesson according to grammatical structures. First, it allows the teacher to sequence the presentation of the grammatical structures from simple to complex. The problem, however, is that at times it is difficult to define what complexity in grammar means. For example, even though modals like can, may, and might are simple, in the sense that they do not require the third-person singular S form, uh, they are extremely complex in meaning. Furthermore, they, they are very common in English. Hence, it is hard to know where a structure like modals belongs in a grammar text. Nevertheless, there is a great deal of similarity in the order in which many grammar points are presented in textbooks that you have nowadays. Second, the approach allows the teacher to present one new grammatical structure at a time, test it, and then proceed to another structure. This step-by-step -step approach often helps students feel that they are mastering the language. It also makes the teacher feel that he or she has covered all important points of the language. Third, since many proficiency tests are designed to test students' understanding of grammatical rules and terminology, a focus on grammar may help students score well on these tests. The main risk of organizing grammar classes according to grammatical structures is that even though students may leave the class knowing a great deal about the structure of the English language, they may not communicate effectively which is, after all, the main purpose of the grammar class. Because of this, many teachers and material designers today believe that grammar classes and texts should be organized according to function and purpose that language serves. Thus, they maintain that in the grammar class, students should be taught various ways to ask for information, make a suggestion, refuse an invitation since these are real reasons for using the language. There are several advantages to organizing a grammar class on the basis of function, and these are the following. First, if teachers carefully select the functions that they introduce in the class, students will learn how to communicate what they want and need to say in English. The challenging task for teachers is to select which functions will be most useful to the students and to decide on the basis of ordering these functions. For example, teachers need to decide whether or not to present the function of asking for information, and if so, whether to teach it before or after the function of making a suggestion. At times, what determines this is the level of difficulty of the language forms which are typically used to express a particular function. Feelings are often expressed with simple statements in the present tense. For instance, when one says, I'm tired, or I'm cold. Hence, this function might be presented quite early. Second, focusing on language functions enables the students to learn that there are several ways of saying the same thing. For example, they will learn that there are several ways of making a suggestion ranging from the formal, as in, I would suggest, to the informal, how about? What the teacher must do is to carefully select which forms to teach for each function and make it clear to the students in which situations each form would be appropriate. A basic assumption is that grammar classes need to give attention to both form and function. In order to use English correctly, students need to become familiar with basic grammatical patterns of English. However, it is not enough that our students know how to make simple statements such as, please pass the rice. They need to be aware of the fact that they are making a request. And therefore, there are other ways of saying the same thing, as in, uh, pass the rice, please, or could I have some rice, please? 
Furthermore, they need to know when it would be appropriate to use each form. If we want our students to learn these things and to use English both correctly and appropriately in our grammar classes, we need to give attention to both form and function. The strategies and techniques described in the first six episodes on the teaching of grammar should be used to encourage our students to use English correctly, meaningfully, and appropriately. As the teacher, you will always be the best person to design the materials you will use with your own class. Whichever technique you decide to use, it is important to keep several principles in mind. First, be certain that your students always understand what they're saying. Use demonstrations, translation, or a combination of these to make certain that your students are aware of what they are communicating. Secondly, when you introduce a new grammar point, select your model sentences carefully. In general, try to introduce one grammar point in a set of model sentences so that your students can better focus on the point you wish to emphasize. Third, always strive to keep the topics unified in theme and related to your students' interests. Whether you select the topic of dating or grocery shopping will depend on the experiences and interests of your students. But one way of providing practice and review of the same structure while maintaining the interests of your students is to vary the content that you use. Finally, use model sentences that reflect actual usage and try to introduce these sentences in situations that might actually call for their use by the students. Remember, in order to communicate effectively, your students must not just know how to use the language correctly. They must also know how to use the language in the appropriate context. A knowledge of language use is the knowledge of how to use language appropriately. But what governs appropriacy? What factors can affect how we choose what words we use? Before I give you the answers to these questions, let's pause for a break. Please stand by.